When we look at it from the perspective of conversations, identity consists of the assessments that we have about ourselves. Welcome to Leadership Impact, the podcast for modern executives who are reinventing leadership within their organizations. With your host, executive leadership coach and CEO of the Granger Network, Carrie Granger, and me, Paul Adams, CEO of Sound Financial Group. This is episode three of our four part series on momentum how to shift your conversations. Welcome to the Leadership Impact. My name is Carrie Granger, and if you're new to the show, I highly recommend starting with our first episode of this season, episode one, which was Inside the Mind of Performers. And if you're a returning listener, welcome back. Today's episode, we are going to look at shifting conversations, which if you have been listening so far in the last few episodes, is one of those intervening mechanisms. Intervening in what? Intervening in our performance, intervening in our horizon of what's possible for us, and ultimately intervening in what we can accomplish in life. Today, I'm joined by Paul Adams. And Paul, you always bring great stuff for us. What do you have today? You know, we talk about conversations and intervening mechanisms. I have a topic that could feel a little bit like the third rail to many people. And yet, I'm going to encourage everybody to stick in it with me. I am also going to, I think today, get a chance to demonstrate how good Carrie is in the moment because I want to talk politics. Uh Uh-oh. (laughs) <laughs> and and here's why. I think everybody can relate to how derailed people get based upon political conversations right now. That people will hear something on the news and they get stretched out of shape about it. There is somebody that they know who has a differing view on something of political nature. And they say, I can't talk to that person anymore because of X. Or I'm not going to do business with that person because they put X out there in the world on some social media. And I think what starts to happen in everybody's feeling, while there are going to be much better examples inside of your businesses and lives we're going to touch on, what do we do to intervene when people are so far apart in potential disagreement in conversation that somebody says, I can't hear you because you're on the right or I can't hear you because you're on the left, or better yet, I can't hear you because you're in the middle and I'm on the other side. So you look to the, if you're on the right, the person in the middle looks to the left to you. So when we see those kinds of things breaking down where people are stuck in their way of thinking, how can we begin to actually have a conversation? And I think the same things we're going to learn for you here are going to apply to when somebody's stuck in a strategy they want to be in or a tactic and they're wrapped up in their identity in the business because this is the way we ought to do it. And instead, how can we help surf that conversation of bring people back from being committed to the thing they're doing and instead be causing the outcome in the future that they want to create in that conversation? Mm, Wow, Paul, that's a big topic. Um, I told you I'd show people you're good on your feet. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm just going to, I'm just going to respond based on what I hear and what you're saying. And and I'm going to trust that you and I are going to bring it back to the topic of today's episode being conversations. Okay. Indeed. So, um, you know, politics are so, there's so much packed into what you're saying. And when you add politics, that's a whole nother level. I think we got to look both at the politics side and then bring it into uh, where you left it, which is our being in a big disagreement, say in, in business. Uh, So here's the, here's the added layer that politics brings is that the identity Okay, so I identify, in other words, who I am is this position, who I am is on this side, you know, on the left or on the right, or who I am is, you know, fiercely independent, right? So what's an identity? Identity is, is, is made up of a lot of things. And it depends on what 
perspective you're going to look at it from, you know, from the psychological perspective or even biological perspective. When we look at it from the from the perspective of conversations, identity consists of the assessments that we have about ourselves. Mm. So if I say that this position, like the far right position or far left position, I assess that that position is how how to the right way to fulfill on what's fundamentally important to me and what's fundamentally important to society, which, of course, is an assessment. And I identify with that, then any threat to that is a threat to me. So it's politics is really hard because I identify with my position. Now, when you go into the office, sometimes we identify with our positions and our solutions. And sometimes we just think we don't necessarily identify with it. We just think it a different way. But when we're actually identifying with a certain conversation, with a certain uh, assessment, when you say something contrary to that, you're contrary to me as a person. So it takes me out of the capacity to really have a back and forth with you because what's at stake in the conversation isn't just what we ought to do. What's at stake in the conversation is me, is my very identity, who I think I am. And if I may, just a metaphor, I remember hearing years ago from a CEO that was a mentor of mine, and what he brought up was anytime you bring somebody an opposing view from what they're currently doing or thinking about, you're threatening their survival because they're, mm -hmm. they've actually made it through life. However they have, those ideas or the ways they've been doing things has kept them going and given them whatever success they had. Yeah. So what's, you know, what's the way out is, is this is going to say what sound way more simplistic, right? But, but at least it's a certain direction that we can start to play around with and, and open, uh, create some openings for us because when we're threatened, you know, there's no openings, there's just closures and protection and things like that, you know, uh, fighting or flight, whatever that is, fight, flight, flee, freeze, freeze. Okay. So what's the way what, you know, what's the start of a way out is, is to re to recognize, man, I've identified with my position, but my position is just, you know, it's just a position. So what's a position? What's a solution? A position or a solution is something that we make up or what we arrive at, but its sole function is to fulfill on something that is fundamentally important to us, to fulfill on a fundamental care that we have. You know, at one time in my career, I worked with somebody who actually consulted for the conflict in Northern Ireland. Mm. And he had two paramilitary troops the Catholics and the Protestants in a room together. And, you know, one side's, their position was, you know, you got to, I got to kill those Protestants, the Catholics, but you got to kill the Protestants because, well, why do you have to kill the Protestants? Because underneath it all, they, that was their solution to fulfill on what they cared about. What did they care about? A safe future, a secure future for their family. Now you ask the Protestants, so you got to kill those Catholics. Why? Because underneath it all, mm -hmm. that's the only solution I see to fulfill on having a secure future for my family. And when they both hurt, when both sides hurt that, now I'm oversimplifying it, please. I'm way oversimplifying it. But when you got down to the very bottom and they both hurt each other, both sides, they hurt each other. They laid down their arms in this particular, uh, you know, this group of people. And because they got down to the fundamental care. And I see that in these intractable conversations, these intractable issues is when we're so attached, I'm going to say attached to our position or our solution that we actually lose sight of what we fundamentally care about. And when we're so attached, we get rigid. We have no flexibility. We have no capacity for conversation. So uh, if we if we can start to release that attachment and to see, wow, that's, that is just, like truly is just the position that I arrived at, but the only purpose of a position is to fulfill 
on what's fundamentally important to me. And if we could have a conversation that begins at what's fundamentally important to me and really be committed to that, we might be able to create new solutions. We might be able to learn something from the different positions and points of view that could enhance my own solution. So if in a political conversation, you're going to advocate for some policy, Mm -hmm. stay centered first in what's the outcome you want that policy to produce. Otherwise, it derails into a conversation about, well, you just want the hospitals to get rich, or you are just okay with death panels of the government or whatever, whatever thing that they go to that are those policy positions instead of the outcome position. Right. You know, and it does remind me, just as you had brought the our um, workplaces into it, it, it reminds me a lot when uh, working with leaders and, and not not necessarily leaders, like really any position in an organization is we often we can start to identify with our function you know, Mm. marketing or sales or, or operations, or, you know, I work in a lot of academic environments, like a military academy, where there's military and academics, and they had to kind of function in both cares and concerns, or an academic medical center in which there's both academics and medical clinical uh, training. And there's a, there's a whole different set of concerns, but in our, it's really easy to identify with our function, and to, and to wrap ourselves around the outcome or the position of our function, like, you know, I have to do this and to lose sight of the ultimate outcome that our organization is out to fulfill on and to lose sight of the different cares and concerns and commitments of all other functions. And when we can orient ourselves to that ultimate outcome, then we start to see other functions as collaborators rather than competitors for dollars and resources and time. One of the things that's was the best memory I have of somebody not being attached to their position of an original statement or their position in their role in a particular set of conversations is actually uh, Lindsay Lewis Joyner on your team. Oh, really? Tell me. Yep. We, we had, a, I don't know if you remember this, there was some time ago that you and I were on the phone. It was me, you, the podcast production team, and... Lindsay was on the call and we had an idea of what to do to fix a particular technical problem. And Lindsay said, I think we should do this thing. And between me, you and the production team, we went round around the tree, took 45 minutes. And the ultimate solution was her original idea. And here was what I experienced in her that changed everything in the way I view, even the way I do things is we got back to landing right on her solution. I actually talked to her about it uh, about a week later. And what I said was, I noticed that as soon as we landed back on her solution, she very easily, with no bile, vitriol, or sarcasm, said, I am so glad that worked out. Okay, let's pivot. Here's what we want to get done on this episode. And she started directing us again. And And I was, and there was about three or four times over the 45 minutes, she says, what if we just try this? That then after it works, club everybody with the idea that you just wasted 45 minutes if you would have listened to me first. So I talked to her about it later. I said, why were you that way? You mean, why were you so great? You weren't so. Why were you so great? Yes. Because I was like, one, number one, I probably wouldn't have been. If that many people ignored me for 45 minutes of my input, and then my input is the one that worked. I said, second, I don't know very many people that would have been that great. Why was that? And you know what she shared with me? She says, because where I center my commitment is the outcome we wanted to be after. That day, we wanted to record two episodes. Me saying anything about you guys not listening to me for 45 minutes didn't serve where I was centered in, which was the outcome of the conversation I wanted to be in. And she was able to just leave all the rest behind. That to me was magical Mm -hmm. to watch somebody do that. And I think we don't get a chance to see that often enough, which is why when we do see it, it stands out tremendously. Like when somebody gives us that kind of grace, it also deeply endears us, but the grace doesn't have to come from like some deep spiritual component of their life. It could just be from being committed to a larger outcome than being right about wasting 45 minutes of her time. 
Yeah. Paul, I knew eventually we would come around to the topic of this episode. <laughs> so here's the link I'm going to make for us. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm so grateful you were talking about somebody on our team. I just, you know, I mean, she's, uh, thank you for that. You know, I, I think that when she listens, she'll be really acknowledged by that. Uh, so here's the thing. Fundamentally, we have lived with a somewhat passive relationship to language somewhat passive, like it's just the thing that we do or we talk about to describe our world. However, you know, Lindsay was oriented in and something for all of us in our own performance and being able to accomplish both, uh, you know, anything we're out to accomplish, but in particular, some of these intractable issues is that language is not merely an exchange of information. It actually creates reality. Mm. So how often are we actually intentional that, you know what, in this moment, I'm co-creating reality with you through our conversation. And what is the outcome that I want to accomplish? And how do I have my conversation, my mood, my physicality, but this episode, my conversation be a match for that? You know, be oriented that language doesn't describe, doesn't merely describe reality. Like, oh, that makes me frustrated. You guys didn't listen to me. But to use language to create reality. We're accomplishing this outcome. We're out for two episodes. Let's go. Yes. So in any, in any moment, we can use, we can have an active relationship to language and to realize that it's the language itself that we use as a medium, as leaders, to invent, to fulfill, to move forward on that which is most important to us. We can invent the future that other people are going to live into with that language if we pay attention to what's falling out of our mouth. Yeah, like what's my having intentional communication? What do I intend to happen? Let me stand there and be an expression of that rather than be an expression of my current feelings and frustrations and, and all of that. You know, the other thing is, is we're always co-creating together. So if we're in a, if we're in a conversation around our politics and you're talking about your position and I'm talking about my position, you know, it's we're co-creating our reality, our experience, our outcomes was possible. We're in a co-creation and a dance together all the time. And that's another thing, you know, as leaders, we often think that, well, the leader, you know, I set the vision and then everybody follows me. And I mean, that's nothing could be further from the truth. It all gets co-created in our conversations. And it's the conversations that open up or close down uh, opportunities for us. So if we're intentional in the way that we're speaking and we're aware that our conversation is what's creating and what's moving us you know, we can actually access an enormous power for ourselves as leaders. You know, I always try to give our listeners every week, what's the thing you can listen to and hold on to is just start to distinguish when you're writing an email. Yeah. That's probably the easiest one to see, sending a text to your spouse. Am I describing reality or am I creating a reality with this email? Yeah. And you'll, um, uh, sorry, Paul, I, I have to interrupt you. Yeah. Cause it's a good question, but then you also got to realize, no, you're always creating reality. So am I perpetuating, am I creating the kind of reality I uh, want to create? Yes. I, I, so I, by the way, so that was wonderful because what I think I just demonstrated is the problem our listener could have is thinking that there's two different things you could do when in yes. fact, you're always creating reality, both for yourself as you constitute new things and for anybody who's experiencing the other end of your communication. And that doesn't mean- In every reaction. Yes. So, and you're not just doing it like uh, right now in the Pacific Northwest, we've had some big fires and the, the, it's all cloudy up here in Seattle and smoky. Well, I could A- think I'm describing the color of the sky and the particulate level in the air. But what I'm actually doing is creating a reality, both for me and the person I'm talking to for how they might experience the smoke in the air. And I'm creating a reality of how I'm going to be perceived by that person based upon how I talk about the thing that I think I'm describing in reality. But in fact, I'm creating a new experience for both of us. That sounded like I just went down a very deep rabbit hole. I hope yes. you all felt the same way. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and on a future episode, one of the things we can do, if if our listeners would enjoy that, is that we can actually distinguish what kind of language is the most powerful in creating a new reality, right? And what kind of, you know, what's the kind of language that we use that really opens up new opportunities for us? And what's the kind of language that we use that just kind of perpetuates the, you know, predictable direction that we're on? You know, what kind of language kind of keeps us stuck and what kind of language yes. gets us out of stuck? Oh, I think people are going to tune in for that because I know I want to hear that episode now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. I That's what I was just thinking. Uh, but I got to tell you, this is another one of those episodes, Carrie, that I find myself reeling from yeah. is that you create the distinction of the two different ways we think like, hey, we're creating a new vision for the future or we're describing a reality, which is I think where probably most people thought about language. And the better job we do of describing the world and the future that we'd like to see, we are creating our experience and theirs in each of those conversations. So Carrie, before we close, let me thank you once again for creating one of those key distinctions for me. And I'm sure for our listeners that we come into the episode, you create this distinction for us of, are you describing reality or creating reality with your language? And then shock us with the idea that we're actually creating reality the entire time. We're creating reality for ourselves. I'm leaving the episode today being one of those people that's super grateful that these episodes exist. So A, I can go back and listen to them, but more importantly, so that I can introduce them to the our clients and our team, because the ideas that you bring give me new ways that I can move in my business beyond this one thing that I learned today that will open up new chapters of relationship and opportunities that wouldn't have existed otherwise. So for that, I thank you and the Granger Network for putting us in the position to help me be more high performance leader. Thank you for tuning in to Leadership Impact, the podcast for modern executives who are reinventing leadership within their organizations. Subscribe now at grangernetwork.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And to support you and your leadership impact, we've created an exclusive set of guiding questions on today's topic. Just text the word conversation to 900-900 and you'll receive the link. We also have some special offers for you. Between now and the end of 2018, you can register for our upcoming productivity and accomplishment workshop for 25% off or any of Carrie's online courses for 50% off with the coupon code CELEBRATE as we celebrate our launch at GrangerNetwork.com. Join us for our next episode on Momentum.